This episode of the Kind of Funny Games cast is brought to you by Dollar Shave Club. You don't need to choose between price and quality. You get an amazing and affordable shave. DollarShaveClub.com is the answer to prove how amazing their shave really is right now. They're going to give you your first month free to join the club. DollarShaveClub.com delivers amazing razors right to your door for a third of the price of what the greedy razor corporations charge. Join the club just like I didn't stop dealing with the drugstore hassle and battle the locked up razor fortress ever again. I've been looking damn good, right, Kev? Yeah, Tim. Thanks, Kev. Just go to Dollar Shave Club and pick a razor from their lineup of amazing blades. I've been using the executive blade with their Dr. Carver shave butter. I've never used shave butter before, but I'll tell you what, it's good. It, it's damn good. The blade just gently glides for the smoothest shave ever. See why over 3 million members love Dollar Shave Club. They're so confident in the quality of all their products. Now, you can get your first month of the club for free. Just pay shipping. After that, just a few bucks a month. No long-term commitment. No hidden fees. Go to dollarshaveclub.com slash gamescast. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash gamescast. All right, topic two of the day. What games are we playing now? Not much. Really? Yeah. No, no. I mean, I, we, we figure I was doing all that ocean horning. I was, they called me ocean horny for a while because I was so into That's it. That's what you I, know I mean. People on the street. Then we went to GameStop Expo. Yes. I, I always pack the Vita like I'm going to play something, fall asleep on the plane. Then we worked our bottles off, did that. And then Jen came to visit. Mm. So I've really not been playing anything. So, okay, this topic is going to be what games are we playing now? And also, what games have we seen? Because we just were at GameStop Expo. Ah, okay. We got to talk about a whole bunch of things. We had a whole bunch of devs on and stuff. And we saw some pretty cool things. I want to bust out the schedule, if you don't mind. Okay, so go, I can go for through. it. Go Colin, you've been playing stuff. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> Bioshock Collection's out, so I've been spending a lot of time with the original Bioshock, which is one of my favorite games. Uh, holds up wonderfully. Um, really, really uh, recommend that. Uh, I know some people on PC were having some issues what a with surprise. it, which is you know shocking. Huh. But, uh, but PC supposed but to be the PS4 superior version's form fine. Of gaming. It's great, runs great, uh, looks great, plays great. Uh, a little archaic in some of the control schemes, as I discussed. I think on PS, I love you. I think that the um, you know jumping with triangles is a little weird. Crouching with uh, clicking the stick is a little I mean, like we've gone, we've moved on from mm-hmm. this. There's like kind of a more conventional first person control scheme: circle to crouch, you typically extra jump stuff like that. Um, Final Fantasy Tactics. Uh, so uh, I was, <laughs> so I was really pleasantly surprised. You know, Bioshock's one of those games where I, I really adored it, but I also haven't played it uh, in like four years or so. So um, I was like, does it still? I mean, even when I last played it, it was not new. Um, but I was like, you know, does it still hold up? And it very much holds up. The story's great. Raptures are really beautiful, um, beautifully rendered and beautifully realized place, and it's scary. The game's really, really frightening. Um, and Ken Levine's an absolute G. Uh, so I've been playing that and um, playing a little more Overcooked uh, with Aaron. Oh, uh, we really got to stay away from that game, I think, because I actually get vis- viscerally angry when I play it. <laughs> That's uh, so funny. <laughs> like I actually like like I actually. But are you mad because she's? Um, is it because for a while it was like she didn't understand like with inside mm-hmm. she's learning game logic. Is it here that she's just like I cut up onions and you're like we need tomatoes? Yeah, like <laughs> I, it's that she makes it too complicated. Like it's like the control scheme. I'm like it is. You grab. You and you dash cut and you, and you run cut. and you like and that's and just give me the goddamn tomatoes, you know, like, let's go. Let's get this thing. So, like, I actually need to not play it with her because I actually get really ang- like I'm actually getting angry. Like, why aren't we getting three stars on this stage? Like almost one of those things where like, I'm gonna just do it myself. Just take both controllers and just. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we we're trying. We, we jump in and do a few stages uh, or a couple stages a night. But uh, and, we you know, we do the same thing with Tetris. And I played way m- more of inside, but I still have not gotten to the end. Oh, wow. Um. Uh, just kind of like kind of limping through that game. So that's and then I played Oceanhorn and I talked about it on Colony Ray Live uh, this morning. I played Oceanhorn for a few hours. I like it. Um, I think it's so unabashedly and, unash- and 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 not ashamed of being Zelda. That's actually a major turnoff. Like it's just Zelda. There's like it's not like oh I, we're trying to be Zelda or there's elements that are like Zelda. I'm like this is a ripoff. This is actually a, a ripoff of Zelda. This is not a game inspired by it. this is not a game that's informed by it it's fucking zelda and it's good. and it's Fantastic. but it's not as good as any zelda game that i've sure. played so sure. it's so it's so it's it's fun and it's interesting and i like it i'm not i'm not saying i don't like it and pe- i think people that are looking for a zelda on playstation 4 it's on xbox one as well um i think it's even on phones um mm-hmm. i'm not saying that you should necessarily not play it but i'm saying like i was really kind of turned off by the fact that i'm like this isn't this is just Zelda. This is just what a Zelda game you made. 
You yeah. know, like, so, like, everything about it, the story, the characters, the world, the weapons, the hearts, the bombs, the water is just the like enemies. Wind Waker. The enemies are the same. You find a sword and a shield in the Here's beginning. Here's a heart piece. Yeah, like, I'm like, like, you find three things that are clearly a tri like, supposed to be the Triforce. I love go, it. Go to, awesome. the go to the desert and find this. Go to the, and I'm like, all right, like, get your bomb bag. Yeah, like, go get your bomb bag and find your heart pieces. And, and I'm like, all right, that's. But it's got so I'm not trying to sh I'm not so trying to better. shit on it from a gameplay perspective because I actually think it plays fine mm -hmm. and I think it's an interesting game. But I was really I was really turned off by the fact that the uh, that I'm like this is this is like almost like just totally ripping Zelda off, um, which you can say about other games. But at least other games do their own thing. This game doesn't do anything of its own. The only thing in, in the game that I think is unique and interesting and that's really kind of you find in other games on mobile and, and other places is the unique challenges that are, are mm -hmm. that you find in each place. So it's like you know. Kill this many enemies or find Talk this many to these coins many here. People, yeah, 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 and I'm like, that's cool. Like, it gives you a little extra thing to do. The trophy list is pretty robust and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I was more turned off than turned on by Ocean Horn. So I think that's basically it. I, I just redeemed a bunch of codes, and there's um, there's some games I want to mess with. But I, my assumption is that Bioshock is going to occupy me, and Bioshock Two and Bioshock Infinite, hopefully, until uh, Mafia, Mafia. We get Mafia Three. Um, and Mafia Three, I think, looks absolutely fantastic. Can't and I'm, wait. I'm really, 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 really stoked to play that game. Mm. That was I, one I liked Mafia Two a lot. I think that this game's going to be even better. That was one of our segments from uh, GameStop Expo, right? One of the games we got to go see or at least talk about because it wasn't. I don't know how much new stuff we were seeing, but totally, totally can't wait. And again, it's gonna it's gonna be an interesting little race because I think Watch Dogs is looking to scratch the same itch, itch for me that Mafia will be, right? Where yeah. it is, hey, let's go into this world, let's get lost in it, let's really invest time and become these characters and you know uh, get all the upgrades and become all these different things, collect all the collectibles. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what we saw for uh, Mafia 3 continues to make me want that game badly. You know what I mean? And that is yep. where right now, I we were talking about this, I think the other day at dinner or something, where it's like we're in this weird spot, I feel like, right now where there's still games coming out, sure, but the big stuff, I don't even know if there is that are that many big games this year, but the ones that we want are still out just a little bit. So like, when Mafia comes, yeah. Watch Dogs comes, yeah. For me, when Rise of the Tomb Raider comes, like I'm mm. blown away. I, I talked so much shit last year, right? Of like, oh man, I'm playing Rise of the Tomb Raider on Xbox. Should I wait to Platinum? No, that's dumb. I'm enjoying this game. Let's finish this game. Finish the game. I'm like, that was a great experience. It sucks that I won't try to Platinum it next year. And I, I'm... The more we talk about Rise of the Tomb Raider, you know, we, mm -hmm. we saw so much of it. We did the GameStop Expo, uh, first off, segment about Rise of the Tomb Raider 20-year celebration. But then we worked the square room with all the managers. So we talked about Rise of the Tomb Raider and uh, talked to the developers a little bit there. Even talked to the audience about Tomb Raider. Um, to replay Rise of the Tomb Raider, to use the classic Lara skins, to do the story DLC I never did before, mm -hmm. to go in and do Croft Manor with PlayStation VR, to fuck it. Like, I'm super stoked to get lost back in that game again. And I'm in because it was such a fulfilling, fun time to play. And yeah. it, again, the thing is, it's, it's going to be another one where I don't. It's going to be interesting for me when I put all these games in the basket, which ones actually get to the platinum or the 100% or whatever, because I'm interested in Rise of the Tomb Raider because it was beautiful, because it was fun, and because it was, you went into these new areas and it was, oh, fuck, like, there's five treasures here. I'm going to get each one of those and go over to this. And so if it just becomes that I go from starving for a game to get lost in, to do all the, be the completionist in, to knock out all these checkmark boxes, when they're all here, what, what is that going to be? I'm sure yeah. I'm not going to do it with all of them. Does that mean I don't play all of them as much as I'd like to or which mm -hmm. I think I would? But who knows? Right now, though, can't wait for us at Tomb Raider. Yeah, it's coming soon, too. October, October 11th. 11th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to touch back on Mafia real quick because I thought you were going to go more into that. Sure. No, I want to keep um, talking about Mafia. What else you got to say? I, ju I just really want to like turn people on to the fact that I think that the game is going to be like a, a realized, a, a more realized version of what I think Mafia 2 would have been. And it's connected intimately to Mafia 2 because Vito, Vito is in Mafia 3, who's the main character and the protagonist in, in Mafia 2. Um, I like that it plays uh, with social themes. Um it race? takes it, it takes place um, in New Orleans, or it's not New Orleans, but it's a it's a New Orleans type city mm -hmm. in the '60s, in 1969, I think. You play as a Vietnam, a black Vietnam veteran, um, so you're dealing with a lot of racism and a lot of crime and all those kinds of things um, that were pertinent uh, to the 1960s and to the kind of social uprising and the, and the radical shift that happened after the Civil Rights Act. Um, and the Dixiecrat rise and all that kind of stuff going on in the late 60s. Um, and so I, I think that it's really cool that they're doing that because I think it, it's thought provoking and I think could expose people to what the reality of what what it, it might have been like uh, to be a black person in the South in the 60s. 
Um, also dealing with the trauma of Vietnam War and all those kinds of things. Also dealing with the crime ridden kind of reality of your life um, in that particular city. Uh, so I think that on a, like on just a, on a narrative level, I think that that and a character level, I think that that's really cool. But the the gameplay thing is really cool too because um, you're basically working gangs against each other in the game, and you are you are making friends or enemies with people and, and gangs depending on the decisions you make. So there's a, like, I don't want to say it's nonlinear uh, more than a, an open world game is inherently nonlinear, but it seems like you can totally like, you, you might have to, you partner with a person like an Irish guy, for instance, or you par partner well, with I'm Vito sure, in the Italian gang, but you could do something where you have to actually kill Vito. But there's also a possibility that you have Vito as your friend at the very end of the game. Mm -hmm. And the trophies leaked and there's trophies to like, you know, have them all with you to the very end, like where cool. you don't have to make bad choices. So, or necessarily bad choices to, to keep them. So, um, but it's all about like the, the gang's take and stuff like that. It's all about um, the money that they make. And like you go around and basically do material destruction to the things that they do and to whittle their number down to zero. So you take control of uh, the areas that they control of the city. And so I think it's a really cool kind of checkbox. 100%. Game. Mm -hmm. And um, the combat looks really visceral and violent. Uh, the story looks really cool. Uh, this game has been gestating for a long time. It's a different studio than the, the studio that did Mafia 2. So, um, I have a, and I'm not saying Mafia 2 is a bad game. Mafia 2 was a half baked game, and, and even then, I think it was still actually really good. Um, it reminded me, as I've said before, of The Getaway, in which, uh, which is a fa one of my favorite PS2 games, where you never really got to explore the open world. The open world was there, and you kind of just drove through it. Um, but the story beats were there, and the characters were there. I, I've always said it felt, I mean, very clearly like a Guy Ritchie movie. I think that was the idea. Um, and Mafia 2 was very similar, where like there was just this empty space. That you drove around that was kind of lifeless, but there were the, when you got to the places where you were supposed to be, the story was really cool. And so I think Mafia Three has the potential to have both of those things, and I, I, I that is easily my most anticipated game. I want to play Tomb Raider because I didn't play it on Xbox One. I'm really excited about Gears of War Four, Ooh, um, gotcha. which Greg and I are going to play together. Um, Give me the pound. and uh, Alexander Haig. And yeah, I got I got to revive my Alexander Haig Xbox tag, some from wherever the hell that is. And uh, I think that's the last. I think I, last time I, the only time I might even locked it with that name was when I played Gears Three. Um, but uh, so I but I do agree that we're in a weird void where I'm actually kind of looking forward to not playing too much because other than a few a handful of AAA games and some indies that are coming out that are exciting, I'm going to use this time more to catch up on the things that I want to play. I think that the Arkham collection is going to be exciting to people, and I think that the Bioshock collection is going to be really exciting mm -hmm. and, and thought provoking to people. Um, and then by the time we get to February, when Horizon starts to roll out, and uh, we get you know a bunch of these kind of Q1 and Q2 games, NX is going to be probably in Q2. Um, South then, Park. Uh, South Park obviously is going to be pushed out there. Yeah, South Park was definitely in that mix, yeah. but is no that longer. That would have been my most anticipated um, for the fall. So yeah, Mafia Three is the one I definitely have my eyes on. And as I was looking at the calendar today, I'm like, we're not that far away. Like we probably yeah. should get codes soon. The game's super the game's gold, and the game's through certification because the trophies are live. So I I really do think any day we can, we're going to get mm -hmm. them. Yeah. So I think that that's really I'll check email really right cool. now for you. Yeah. Thanks. There you go. Don't forget Lego Dimensions too. Yeah, me and Greg, we hosted the Square's GameStop Manager thing, so we ran through all of their upcoming games. And, of course, there's the ones that I'm obviously excited for, like Kingdom Hearts 2.8, which now has a release date January 24th, I think it was. And, like, a lot of the stuff in that game is, like, kind of whatever, like the um, Dream Drop Distance, like, I already played on 3DS, so I don't need to replay that. But I'm very excited for the Birth by Sleep point two thing, which is the first time I'm going to get to play Kingdom Hearts in the 3 engine. So at least that's, like, you know, a little hint of some fun to come eventually. Um, but from that presentation, the two things that uh, stood out to me were Nier Automata. Oh, which yeah. Which looks super, super awesome. Uh, and it's a, if you guys don't know, it's kind of, it's an action game developed by, or co-developed by Platinum Games. And it's very, uh, very, it's like Bayonetta and Animusha had like this super awesome baby. And, um, uh, I'm very excited for that. It's early 2017 is all they're saying. Yeah, they actually look cool. Like I like the idea of the RPG stuff later on top of it. You know yeah. what I mean? And I was also blown away by how many people knew about it and were into it. Well, that's one of those like kind of like darling games where it's sure, just like, but I mean, people like, are super, super up on it because it's it looks great. Sure, so. but I mean, it was one of those things where it's the the fraction of the room that knew about it, knew about it, and mm -hmm. was behind it, and was like super in on it, whereas other people weren't. People really like the original Nier, um, and it was one of those... I think people appreciate that Square... Is investing in bringing a sequel out, even though near in no way, shape, or form uh, performed. performed well enough to get a sequel. And so I think, that, and and to nonetheless get a developer of the prestige, although I think a very quickly falling prestige of Platinum Games. But um, this working seems on to be on well. the, the good side of it. I mean, Platinum, even to this day, is is kind of they went from hit to hit or miss, and I think that this falls seemingly on the hit side. Uh, it it looks way <laughs> less like a Ninja Turtles. It does look more like a Bayonetta, and so I'm I'm, I'm stoked for that. Uh, th something that during the presentation looked super lame 
But during me and your time uh, with one of the the guys talking about it was World of Final Fantasy. The uh. the trailer, it was like, oh god, this looks like a mess. Uh, but talking to them and seeing the the footage of the the gameplay and the actual like the story elements and it kind of is just a huge celebration of the entire mm-hmm. Final Fantasy franchise and like all the key moments from each of the games and kind of seeing a different perspective on them and I'm I'm interested to see how kiddy it is because they're definitely towing that line between uh, it's a kid game that adults can enjoy and like oh no it's a great game but it's here's the fan know, service too yeah, yeah they they downplayed uh, you know because I asked them you know I was like you know it seems like it's, the idea is it's supposed to be accessible the the chippy characters don't necessarily give that away because Final Fantasy 4 for instance on DS which is the remake of Final Fantasy 4 uh, the, the chibi kind of style there in Final Fantasy 3 those are really hard games mm-hmm. so that that art style doesn't necessarily betray a certain you know something about the game that says it's for kids but I did bring up a specific game that that is notorious in Final Fantasy which is Final Fantasy Mystical, uh, Mystical Quest which people fucking hate and the reason that that game that game sucks I remember buying it on eBay I didn't even own it at the time I bought it on eBay in like 1997 or something and played it and it's a, it's like baby's first role playing game. It's baby's first Final Fantasy, and that's what. And that game was just a joke. And I I don't want it to be like that. And I don't think it's going to be like that. To that point, um, Dragon Quest Builders looks cool too. And I, yes. and, I and I gotta give props to Square Enix, as we said on the uh, you know I said very vehemently on the on the stream when we were with them. I'm like, you know, Square Enix to their credit is supporting Vita. Yep. Uh, they did it with Adventures of Mana. They're doing it with World of Final Fantasy. They're doing it with Dragon Quest Builders and. I just want to implore everyone out there again, like if you want to see more of these games on your on, on the platform, like a triple A developer is giving you maybe not triple A games, but A games. Yeah. Um, and uh, you need to buy them and support them and show them that we want more of them. So while, while everyone's well, most of the triple A de- devs have long since fleed um, the scene, uh, you know, Activision did like call do like a very shitty Call of Duty game and like Spider-Man. And all exactly, exactly. And then they were out. EA barely did anything. They were out. Uh, Ubisoft did some anecdotal thing, you know, so, some things with Child of Light and all, you know, Rayman, but then they were out. You know, they did Assassin's Creed recently, which sucked. Um, the Assassin's Creed kind of side scrollers, but Square Enix is putting good games out. So, and that's the thing, man, is Dragon Quest Builders runs on Vita. I really think I'm going to play a ton of that open world RPG mixed with Minecraft. Yeah, a thousand percent. That sounds exactly what I want on Vita, right? Because all I ever want on Vita is a game to spend hours with and be in. And like for me, you know, the I know there's so many visual novels and JRPGs and stuff like that. That's not my kind of gameplay. Whereas like open world Minecraft build craft do this. Like even if I mean, I'm not knocking JRPG quest structure. Clearly, I love persona, but there needs to be some hook to it. If the hook can be that you're building and it works and it runs well. I'm all in for that. Yeah. Um, moving off the of square for Ubisoft for honor. Mm. Like I keep saying this, but I don't think I've said it on a show. Like that's a game that surprises me so much. Cause when it was first announced last year at E3, it was kind of like, a, all right, this guy with the beard is in entertaining, yeah. but like what the hell's happening. And then this year at E3, they're focusing a bit more on the multiplayer and all that. And uh, the single player story trailer and shit. And it was kind of just like a, all right. But again, that it fell in the Ubisoft press conference. That was kind of just like, poorly planned i think and programmed so it even if it was a hit it it didn't feel like it um but after talking to a whole bunch of people at pax like people are so high on this game and super into it and then the alpha just happened and we got to sit with one of the the devs on it and like he totally sold me on it like the game looks super awesome it seems like there's a a super fun rock paper scissors style um mechanic going on between the different uh factions and the, the classes within the factions and all that. And it's like, it seems uh, like a different step for Ubisoft, which I think is cool because, you know, we always talk about the Ubisoft game being this open world, whatever. This one seems way more battle focused. Um, it's all about the combat. And it's all about these like one-on-one things. You're not getting the long range fighters and stuff. It is, you're just right there. And there's a lot of AI characters around and you can team up with your friends and you don't all need to be on the same team. So there's the the samurai, the um, Vikings and the, the like more like, Knights, knight yeah. people. Um, your team can be a combination of this one guy's a, a samurai, one guy's a knight, or whatever. And I think that's cool because it allows people to just do whatever they want to. Yeah, and it seems fun. That's the most important part. Everyone that's playing is like, man, this is super fun. But there was a whole bunch of uh, uh, best friends out there when we were doing the stream that went to go play the demo. And they kept coming back and like, dude, For Honor looks awesome. Yeah, so stoked for that surprisingly yeah I'm, I'm skeptical about for honor the, the the reason is is that i think it does look great and and it's the thing is is that it has great buzz um not only people that play at trade shows but with the media um but i just feel like at the same time the media the gaming media like the, you know the overarching kind of mainstream if you want to call it that gaming media 
got really excited about No Man's Sky and they were wrong about that. They got really excited about Watch Dogs. They were wrong about that. Like I just, I just like it, there's always like one of the one or two of these buzz games that are going mm -hmm. on where it's like, oh, like and evolve. like it doesn't ev evolve, you know. It's like, but these don't typically pan out. Yeah. I got a so like I'm just you can't you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I, I want, but like I just feel like. Is this another like everyone hyping themselves up into a frenzy for no reason again? Because uh, the game to me looks fun. It's pretty. Mm -hmm. um, but I certainly don't see uh, why it would demand my attention particularly. So I'm, I'm going to like look into it more when it comes out. I'll play it. But the game that is imminent that looks fucking great, by the way, is Battlefield 1. Um, we saw that at the tr at the uh, the show. They showed mm -hmm. us the um, it was like a desert map from the beta uh, for the multiplayer beta. Uh, the game's beautiful. Um, I really do kind of feel like, based on what I'm seeing of Call of Duty and Battlefield, of which I'll both play. I'll, you know, I I know Call of Duty pretty well. I play the campaign, as everyone knows, uh, pretty much every year, except for last year, I never played that one. Um, seeing these games side by side, I'm like, I think Battlefield One's got your number, man. Like, the, I I just feel like that game is leaps and bounds ahead of it. And what I said to in the every guy, in every facet. Or yeah, every I that? just feel like. Because I'm excited for the Call of Duty this story or Call of Duty. Yeah, the story, story this looks cool. It, you know, it's Taylor and it's the Naughty mm -hmm. Dog guys. And it's like, all right, cool, let's go. Well, that's different in the sense that like they're telling their own story. Battlefield One's telling a kind of a warped World War mm -hmm. One story of, of some sort, a great war. War story. pigeons with the war pigeons, war which pigeons. is a, which is a mode in it. Um, but uh, and that really is a mode in it about war pigeons. But did you know about this? No. There's there's a mode where you actually have to go find messenger pigeons, attach a message to them, and get them to a place to let them fly off to that's cool. give messages. Fuck yeah. Um, I mean, so what I was impressed about was multiple things. And this is what I said from the guy, I, I, I forget his name, um, from Dice that came and talked to us at the GameStop Expo was, I'm really impressed from a design standpoint of, of Battlefield, uh, Battlefield games generally compared to Call of Duty games because it is not infantry only. It's, mm -hmm. or with some drones or with some other things. Like it is a very complex dance that has to be done on the design side to make a game like that work where you will literally have a Zeppelin you have like airplanes, these crude tanks, and then infantrymen, and then all these other tools and kind of, and they all have to work in some sort of symbiotic way so that nothing necessarily has this overt advantage where like if you're in a plane, a sandstorm comes in and fucks your whole day up and suddenly it's actually more advantageous to be on the ground or uh, uh, things like that. So I was like, I'm actually really impressed, not only from a graphical standpoint, because I think the game looks beautiful, it looks like it runs really well. We were obviously seeing PC footage, we'll see how it runs on console. Um, and I like that they're delving into World War One, which I think is an inherently complicated place, and that's why I understand why the guy, the executives at EA, didn't want to do the game originally in World War One because it is. We've often talked about. It, I'm like, I don't understand how you do this, but World War One also has a lot of interesting stories to tell because it is the first real, you know, war of consequence. I, I think you can maybe say the American Civil War and some other wars, um, but it's the first real war of consequence where modernity met. Antiquity, antiquity, really, in terms of the way a war is fought, where horses are fighting against tanks, right? Crude looking metal shell tanks. Um, so I, I want to see how they handle those challenges. I think the campaign's going to be really good, although they've been pretty mum about it. But I, I do want to give a shout out to Battlefield One because I think um, that game looks like a, a return to form for Dice. I think Battlefield Four was very disappointing to a lot of people for multiple reasons, not chief amongst them the fact that the game didn't run for a very long time, and for some people, still doesn't work. Um, properly, so um, as far as I understand, I mean, I'm, I've never played it online, but you still see people fucking bitching and complaining about it. So um, we'll see if it all pans out. But I do want to give a shout out to that game because th that is one of those games. I won't play it for more than a couple of days. I'll get through the campaign and be done with it. But um, I like that they've kind of tackled head on these challenges and and really when you look at, you know, we look at graphics and sound and all these kinds of things and the way the game runs and that's important. But design is really important too. It's one of the most important things, if not the most important, fundamental thing to why a game is good or not. And to be able to balance and marry all those kinds of things, which is what Dice does really well. Mm -hmm. I think is way cooler than a map of 24, 36, wherever sure. people running around a city shooting at each other. It's just not as interesting when you see something like Battlefield 1 in action. It's just like, wow. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, another uh, demo we saw was uh, Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2. And I'm not a big Dragon Ball guy. Uh, but you but, love Xenoverses. No, no, no. Oh, my apologies. Uh, but we had we had one of the, the Bandai Namco guys there, and also we had two professional players of the game. And to see people play on like a high level of that shit, I'm like, damn, what the hell's going on? And it's crazy because, I mean, I've seen Dragon Ball, obviously, so I know how the, the fights go. There's a lot of teleporting, a lot of huge blasts, a lot of like moving around. And um, you're not just moving left to right. There's a lot of up and down. And in the game, they seem to really beautifully kind of managed to uh, recreate that the magic of the, the anime but 
uh, between these two guys playing at a pro level, it seems like they they knew exactly what they were doing and to see them teleporting behind each other and blasting each other in the back and like the destructible environments and stuff. I'm like, dude, this looks awesome. Like the animation looks super great and they seem to be super into it. So that that's another game where I was weirdly impressed by it where I was just like, I couldn't even imagine like them taking a 2D fighting game but making it more of this like 3D and uh, add air like where you're just flying in the air fighting and stuff. Like in Justice, you kind of see moments where they jump in the air and do some stuff and then they yeah, come back yeah. down. This was like the entire camera would shift around and whatever, and it seemed like they knew what they were doing with it. And again, they are people that are very experienced with the game, but I was impressed by that. So 